Hi, I'm Amber Dupuis, and I'm the director of Austin Acting Classes. And today we're going to talk about given circumstances. What are given circumstances? And why are they important to you? And why are they important to your creation of a character? So first of all, what is a circumstance? Well, a circumstance is a fact associated to an event or an action. It's a fact. So what is a given circumstance? A given circumstance is when the author, the playwright or screenwriter, gives you the facts. And these are the facts around the circumstances or the actions of the play. These facts are undeniable. These facts are, are facts that, that form the foundation from whence you can create a character. You cannot deny them. You have to incorporate them in your choices. Now, how do you find the given circumstances? By the way, given circumstances are the first step to script analysis. So while you're working on developing your instrument as an actor, you may also be studying about how to analyze a script. So the first step is finding and identifying the given circumstances. The given circumstances are usually the answer to the five W questions who, what, where, when, and why. The what and why are a little bit more difficult to determine. They're often not given to you right away. You have to kind of go through the script a couple of times to really understand that and figure that out. So after you've read the play once or twice, it's time to start analyzing. And so we're going to look for the given circumstances first. We're going to, give, we're going to look for what the author gives you. And the best place to look for that is on the first page. For example, say you get cast in Streetcar Named Desire. Of course, that's written by the great Tennessee Williams. And I will tell you this, Tennessee Williams as a playwright really gives you the circumstances in his scene descriptions. Not all authors do that for you. So let's look at what he has to say. Scene one. I'm not going to read you the whole description because it's actually four paragraphs long, but that's how much information he gives you. Uh, essentially, he tells you the play is set in New Orleans, and he also talks about it being the section is poor. Unlike corresponding sections in other American cities, it has a charm. And he talks about it's the first dark night of an evening early in May. Also here, the piano playing down the street, and he gives you the name of the song, The Blue Piano. Uh, he talks about some of the women that are uh, sitting on the steps of the building. And then he goes into his description of the two men, who are the two leads, Mitch and Stanley. And he says, Two men come around the corner, Stanley Kowalski and Mitch, and they're about 28, gives you their age, or 30 years old, roughly dressed in blue denim work clothes. Already gives you an idea of their class. Stanley carries his bowling jacket and a red stained package from, a, from the butcher shop. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about Stella. Stella comes out on the first floor landing, a gentle young woman, about 25, and a background obviously quite different from her husband's. And then flash forward to Blanche. Blanche Dubois comes around the corner. She's carrying a valise. And let's see, her expression is one of shocked disbelief. And she's wearing, let's see, a fluffy bodice, necklace and earrings of pearl, white gloves and a hat looking as if she was arriving at a summer tea or cocktail party in the Garden District. She's about five years older than Stella. So you can see he gives you a lot of given circumstances, and these are things you must honor when you're creating these characters. They also help you open up your imagination. And in today's world, you've got the internet. So you can go and type in New Orleans. Uh, he didn't give us the date, but we could probably figure that out. Um, through reading the entire play about when it, it was set. Look those dates and, and locations and May and the part of town he's talking about online and you, you'll have pictures, you'll have all kinds of things to feed your imagination and help you really step into the character 
into the imaginary circumstances. And now I'd like to introduce you to a local actor, Rob Matney. He'll be playing Treblyoff in Anton Chekhov's The Seagull. And the reason I've asked him to perform this for you is so that you can listen for all the given circumstances in this monologue. Anton Chekhov writes in the given circumstances into the dialogue. So listen for all the facts about this character. Thank you. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. See? <laughs> My mother does not love me, and why should she? Yeah, she's wants life, romance, sumptuous gowns, and me. A, 25 years old and a constant reminder that she's reached a certain age. And she knows I don't respect her stale brand of theater. My mother loves the theater, imagines she serves all of humanity with her sacred art. But as far as I'm concerned, the modern theater is choked with cliches when another when the curtain goes up on yet another sunlit drawing room, when those celebrated actors, the high priests of a holy art, demonstrate how people eat, drink, love, walk, button their jackets, when they strain those letters and scenes trying to extract a moral, simple and modest, useful around the house, and when every variation Turns out the same time after time after time, I run. I, I run away like Maupassant from under the Eiffel Tower, which was battering his brain with its disgusting banality. We need new forms. New forms are what we need, and if we can't have them, we're better off with nothing at all. I love my mother. Love her dearly, but she drinks, smokes, carouses with that novelist, and her name is always in the newspapers, and it makes me sick. Sometimes it's just my ego talking. I'm only human, after all. Sometimes I think it would be better if my mother weren't so famous. I think if she were a normal woman, I'd be happy. Uncle, tell me, isn't that maddening? Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> My mother's parties are packed with celebrities, actors, and writers, and then there's me. <laughs> I'm nobody. They tolerate me because I'm her son, but who am I? I left the university in my third year thanks to circumstances beyond the editor's control. I have no talent, no money, and a passport reading bourgeois, place of birth, Kiev. My father was a bourgeois from Kiev, but he was a famous actor too. And there you have it, when these uh, actors and scholars and writers in my mother's drawing room would bless me with a moment's attention. I could only imagine they were contemplating my insignificance. I knew what they thought. It was so humiliating, so painful. Thank you, Rob. So let's go back and reiterate the facts that we heard in that wonderful monologue. I'm looking at Anton Chekhov's play right here, The Seagull, and these are the facts. Treplev not only feels unloved by his mother, but he feels she hates him. He says he's 25 years old. His mother is 43, but, not, but does not like that truth to be known. 
So one may assume she's probably a narcissist. She's a famous actress, and her son does not respect the theater of his time. He loves his mother deeply and wishes her to be an ordinary woman. Also, we learn he's humiliated by his defeats. He didn't finish the university. He has no talent nor money, and he feels socially inferior. His father was middle class, but a famous actor. Based on the use of the past tense of the verb, we may assume his father is probably dead or is no longer part of the family. So, given all those wonderful facts, well, they may not actually be wonderful for him, but for us as the creator, given all those facts, we can start to kind of get an idea and develop a point of view of this character what this character's point of view of the world is. And Larry Moss suggests that you use three adjectives to describe a character's point of view. So, would you say this character, character's point of view of the world is safe, friendly, and loving? Probably not. So you come up with three characters you think that would describe Trebliov's point of view of the world. Thank you so much.